Mm. Oh, thanks. I needed a book. There we go. Does God have to explain himself to us or only act as we see fit? I mean, it seems like an easy question, but just think about it before you answer. What do you guys think? Yeah, I don't think he has to, but I think depending on the person and situation, sometimes he does. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Like, for instance... Concrete and, examples and leaving us to just trust in him, you know. Mm. Um, like, we're, it seems like you're talking in theoretics. Let's talk in more. Uh, well, like, so, like, like with Sam, you know, God has made a promise that Sam will be saved, and so that is something that I know is going to happen. Okay. But in the meantime, there's all these things that are happening that I'm going, why is this happening? Okay. And God does not explain that. Okay, you know, I see. Yeah. God does not tell me example. why this is happening right now. All I need to know is that he has made a promise, and that's what I need to trust in. Don't continually question God, why is this happening? Why is this happening? Why is, you know, why is that happening? Because it's almost like, God, you've made a promise. Why are you letting this happen? Mm. Why don't you just feel, fulfill that promise? Okay. But I think that God being God does not act only as we see fit. Because if God acted technically how I saw fit, he would make a promise and he would save Sam now. I got you. making us go through all of this nonsense. <laughs> but the thing is... <laughs> is that God has given us free will. We have choices to make. Yeah. But God is merciful. And God will let us continue on in our mistakes to our own demise. But he knows how to draw people to him. You know, it's like he knows that Sam is going to have to dig himself this gigantic hole. And he's not going to bail Sam out. But he's merciful, and he's going to continue to give Sam ways out. Okay, so if Sam chooses those ways out. So let me follow that up with a question. Nicole, what do you think about this, okay? What if God were to act in a way that you don't think is right? What do you think? I don't, I don't know. I don't get what you're saying. Like, okay, um, if, <laughs> if uh, you're reading in the Bible and God does something, or it says that God does something, and you're just like, God can't do that. You know what I mean? Like, that's, that's wrong, right? 
You know what I mean? What would you do in such a situation? I would just put, I would just trust that he knows what he's doing, and regardless of the situation, you know, he knows, he knows what the outcome's going to be. Hmm. So just keep trusting in him. And okay. So what about in the situation like Serena brought up? Great example, really. Um, and try and put yourself in her shoes. So like you're the one who's married. Okay, and and it just doesn't really seem like maybe God is ignoring you or maybe God is, you know, enjoying your pain or <laughs> whatever. <laughs> just kind of having to agree with what she said is just keep trusting. Okay. And just, you know, relying on that promise. Okay. So kind of just not really looking at the, at the things, just kind of trusting it's beyond your, your understanding. Just a little bit of a catch-up, Grace. Um, uh, no mustard, though. Uh, we've been talking. Uh, we're talking about this question here. Does God uh, have to explain Himself to us, and only actually as we see, as we see fit? And Serena brought up the example of um, uh, uh, Sam's salvation. How there's a promise given, but yet the immediate reality is not. Um, what's the word? Congruent, I guess, or um, cohesive with that uh, promise. And so then uh, we were just talking about um, what do you do in a situation where you don't think God is acting according to His character. Okay, well, did, did you still have some Well, to say? another thing about, uh, you know, does God have to only act as we see fit? And I think one thing that I, I know I hear a lot is, um, if God is love, then why would a loving God let all kinds of people go to hell? We're actually talking about judgment tonight. <laughs> so, why? Because God does not let people go to hell. People send themselves there. And I think that's just a lack of understanding that people have of God's character and also of the Bible, knowing that God did not create hell for people, but for Satan, you know, and the fallen angels. Um, but that we, you know, we we did sin, and, and now we are born into sin, and, and it's a choice that we make, not God's sin. God's not sending us to hell, you know. He's not. Oh, you screwed up, you know. Like, right. like, like we send our kids to time out, you right. know. God does not send us there. God gives us multiple times in our lives to accept. So limbo. Him. Just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, okay, so let's play. You guys ever play um, pretend when you were kids? Yeah. Okay, so let's play a little pretend. You guys are a um, CEO of a major corporation. You can pick whichever one you're. It doesn't matter. So you're just you're you're on top of the world, okay? Are your are your personas set? Yeah. Okay. And I want you, as the CEO of your corporation, to tell me what you are looking for when you when you're gonna take over another business. What are you looking for? Like Grace, let's start with you. And we'll go with Nicole or Serena Nicole. Um, first off, uh Probably how many people shop. Okay. How many people use the product. Okay. All right. Because if it's if it's like a couple thousand versus a couple million, yeah, I might not want that company. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Serena, what are you gonna look for, Miss CEO, Miss Manager? I'm gonna look for you know the demand of the product that I'm selling. Okay. You know, if it's in high demand, if it's a quality, you know, product like, am I selling an Apple or a Zoom? Because <laughs> <laughs> the Zooms went Zoom? out. Are you talking about because Zooms went out of production? Is that <laughs> yes. what you're talking about? Okay, you know, am, am I taking over <laughs> something that's going to continue to flourish or that's going to become obsolete? Okay. So, okay. I Go. would actually look at the quality of the current bosses and the employees. Okay, like what do you mean? On how they rate the job. Okay. And how they like it. Mm. And then also look at the product too, but based okay. more on people's experience. Okay. So what would probably be the worst business decision you could make in buying another corporation? Gracie? Probably if they're really far in debt. <laughs> okay. Because if they're really far in debt, chances are they weren't doing the marketing right, 
and people are going to expect that with the next owner. I got gotcha. you. Kind of like what happened with Hastings. Exactly. Uh, Serena. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I actually have to agree with, with Gracie. You know, what is the infrastructure of this? company like uh -huh. is it collapsing or is it growing okay if you're walking into something and, and you're going to have to rebuild from the ground up uh -huh. i'm not rebuilding from the ground up <laughs> ain't nobody got time for that ain't nobody got time for that nicole what do you think um worst decision you're going to make as a ceo with buying out a corporation not doing research okay like no, what do you mean on the company. okay like not knowing no, the yeah just stepping jumping in deep first i got gotcha. you instead of looking at you know all the information about the company and just then doing research on it, just not doing any research, not knowing what you're getting into. Okay. So now let's kind of mix things up here. That's kind of what God did. He, think of him as kind of a, um, a CEO of a major corporation called Heaven. <laughs> and he took a, a net loss. What that means is... <coughs> you sunk more money into the thing that you're doing than it's actually worth mm -hmm. by saving people. See, he didn't really have anything to gain from it, did he? Right. See what I mean? Yep. Now, obviously, um, he gets glory and honor out of this, but, I mean, he's kind of had to endure a lot of crap throughout the process of it. See what I mean? So in human terms, is that a smart investment? No, in human terms, it's a stupid thing to do, right? Nobody on earth would dare sacrifice their corporation for the sake of this dwindling corporation, right? Right. So, I mean, in human, understand that doesn't make sense, and yet God still does it. So, so I mean, God oftentimes does an act, act as we see fit, not only in, in a negative connotation, but also in a positive one, like our salvation. One that doesn't really make sense if you actually stop to think about it, and yet God would come as a human to do that thing for us. See what I mean? Yeah. So, um, okay. All right. So with that, we're going to look at some confusing passages. Um, and I think it's confusing because of the modern kind of culture that we're in. You have people going to two, kind, two kinds of extremes um, with uh, Bible study and with um, Christianity in general. Uh, Serena already brought this up to some extent. Uh, on one hand, you know, you walk into a church and it's legalism. Everything's just dead. You know, you have to follow all these tenets and commands and doctrines and everything just to be able to be welcomed in to attend the church. So, I mean, like, I think of, I was at Men's Meet today, and, and one of the guys, Larry, he was talking about how he was at this bar, and he walked in out, in with his hat on, and so they kicked him out and didn't even allow him to buy anything because he, he had a hat on. He said, I'm sorry, I didn't know I, I was a thing. And they're like, well, you should have. Get out. So like, whoa. Wow. <laughs> whoa. <laughs> See what I mean? Like, uh, yeah. um, but then on the other extreme, there's people who say, God's love, God's love. Yes, absolutely. But, and I'll talk about this in a minute. If God has nothing to set us free from, there's nothing for him to be patient about. Right. And if there's nothing for him to be patient about, we can't really really glory in his patience, can we? Right. See what I mean? The fact that his patience necessitates that there's something he's being patient against. For example, his wrath. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. So Genesis 6, 5 through 6. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth. Or another translation said, or he was sorry that he that he had made man. Um, and another translation said something along the line of, lines of he repented that he, that he had made man. Okay, um, And it grieved him to his heart. Okay, so now that brings up this question here. If God is all-knowing and never-changing, why was he sorry or felt regret? Because he, he already knew it was going to happen. And he never changes, right? And yet it says specifically that he was sorry. See what I mean? Yeah. Well, be, I think it's because he's, he still gives us free will so we can choose one way or the other. Mm -hmm. And I personally think it's because he was kind of disappointed that we didn't choose the other way. Either. That's a good answer. That's a good answer. Does anybody else have anything? Or were you were you done? No. I'm, I didn't mean to cut you off. No. Did anybody else have anything to say? I mean, I, oh, that's a good answer, Grace. Gold star for Gracie. <laughs> <laughs> Did anybody else have anything? Okay. Um. So, well, before I say that. Okay. 
Uh, can I have a volunteer? Uh, <laughs> to kind of drive this point out. Okay. Okay, Sam, come here. <laughs> now, you're God, okay, oh. and I'm people, okay? Okay. Now, put your hand here. Okay. Please don't hurt me. <laughs> <laughs> right? I'm going to smack your hand very hard. Do you understand? Yes. Do you know what I'm going to do? You're going to smack my hand very hard. Now, do you think me telling you that I'm going to smack your hand is going to make it any less painful when I smack your hand? You're not really going to smack your hand. If there was Ben, I would have smacked your hand. But it's, it's <laughs> just to get the end, that, that, that was it. Okay. Uh, do you guys kind of get the example there? God knew that they were going to do it, but that doesn't mean that he didn't experience the pain right. that it did happen. He, God still does experience things as they happen in, in time, even though he did create time. I know it's a confusing concept, but it's a concept never the same, nevertheless. So, anyways. Uh, what? I said that makes sense. Um, repented isn't a very accurate word, though. It's usually in the older translations that it says something along the lines of repent, God repented. Um, God being sorry is more accurate, and I think the ESV kind of really nails it with it with how it says. And I'll read it one more time. There in verse uh, six, it says, "And the Lord regretted that He had made man on the earth." And if you, the very next verse kind of clarifies what that means. And it grieved him to his heart. It would cause him such intense pain that nobody was seeking him in the whole world except for Noah. Well, I think like so. sometimes we'll do something, we'll make the decision and say, I'm going to regret this later. <laughs> right? And then we, get, we do it and we're like, yep, I regret that. Well, that, yeah, but to a lesser degree with God, because remember, um, he, he foresaw that that was going to happen and everything, but he chose to undergo it for the sake of even the one. No right, one. he wouldn't have changed his mind. Right, exactly. Exactly. Uh, and that's why I think repented is kind of a, a, a poor translation to use for that word. Right. Anyways, um, so we see, first off, God hates sin. I think that a lot of times people forget this. Sin is anything that goes against God's character mm -hmm. by nature. And so with that being said, I mean, God, God hates it. So, I mean, and it goes against who he is as a person, the character and essence of who God is, who is loving and patient and, 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 and long-suffering and that kind of stuff. That is the essence of God. And so sin is something that goes completely and totally against that um, nature. Um, so God's love and patience kind of foreshadows or, or tells of um, his justice. Because if justice is truly just, it demands action. Let me give you another example. I'm a judge. Nicole has just raped and killed five children. Am I going to be a good judge if I say, whatever? Who here would say that that's a good judge? Nobody? See what I mean? God's justice demands that he takes action for the sin that, 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 that happens. However, there's a way out of this. Sin, the, 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 the rewards or the consequences of sin is death because it goes completely against God's character. So it, it necessitates death. God temporarily allowed a, an animal sacrifice for, 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 for a very limited time. He allowed that. But it was insufficient because, well, I'll get into this when we in next month when we talk about the purpose of the law. But um, long story short, Jesus um, kind of took that for us. So, I mean, he died in our place. Being fully human, he could. And being fully God, he could. So, you know what I mean? Uh, it, yeah, I can't get into it this week. It's too much of an off-branch, but surely I hope you kind of get what I'm saying here. Um, so the, the it's not that God overlooked it. It's that Jesus paid the price for us. Does that make sense? Yeah. God, God didn't overlook it. So when somebody rejects Jesus, they're rejecting the only hope that man has of atonement for that um, sinfulness. Right. And Which brings up the point that people, by their very nature, are sinful. We don't have to try to be sinful. Um, we're born into sin, we live in sin, and we die in sin. That's just the course of our lives. We think on evil, we we do evil. So, I mean, when somebody wrongs us, our instant our instant um, response is uh, judgment or um, vengeance. Yeah. See what I mean? And that's our inst instant thought. But yet God says not to do that. So I mean, therefore, saying that it's sin, right? Right. See what I mean? So, anyways, I think you guys kind of get what I'm saying. Um, 
So it's just this demands action, though he is patient and merciful. Now, a judge can decide to take pa to be patient and merciful towards someone, obviously, and since he is the judge, he can do that. Um, also, uh, point two in this is that nobody was seeking God. Their plans or their intentions were only evil. In other words, you know how sometimes you have an idea of doing something good for someone? You're like, I'm going to go cut that old lady's uh, grass for her. You know what I mean? You just have a good thought. Their intentions or their plans for, for life in general was evil continually. They didn't have a good good intentions with their hearts. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, basically, everybody was doing whatever they wanted, whenever they wanted, however they wanted. Does that kind of make sense? So it, we're talking about extreme evil. And I know a lot of times people um, contrast the modern society with this. The modern society is nothing like this. Um, I'm not saying we're righteous. Definitely not saying that. The only way to righteousness is through Jesus. But sometimes to contrast, people kind of lose sight of the – what do you say? Lo lose sight of the forest for the trees. Yeah. They kind of miss focus of what the Bible is actually trying to say by trying to prove their, their point. Um, so um, oh, this is also similar to what happened with Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, we'll look at that in just a second. But um, they – it says that God gave them one last test to allow them a chance um, uh, to be saved. And what had happened was um, there wasn't a single person in the city who stood up for the angels that, that, that God sent. It was just Lot who gave them shelter. Everyone, it says everyone else in the entire uh, town came to, to uh, rape the angels. So, I mean, the place was evil. See, I mean, it's just kind of a thought there. Um, and, yeah. God still experiences, and though he knew it would happen, it greatly displeased and hurt him. His character didn't change. He acted and felt according to the situation that was. Um, so, Genesis 18, 20-23. Then the Lord said, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me. And if not, I will know. Um... So then Adam, Abraham goes and says, okay, what if there's just this many left in the city that are righteous? And he, the number keeps going down. I think he starts with 40, or hold on, 50. If 50, then 45, then I think 40, then 35. Anyways, he ends up with, with, with a small number, like somewhere around 10 or 5 or something like that. And God says, okay, I won't destroy it if there's just that many left. And um, so then the question comes, why did God have to see if he already knew, and also, would he have killed the righteous without Abraham asking? And I know this is a loaded question. Nicole, what do you think? Hard one, huh? <laughs> I think it's kind of one of those things where... Okay, like in 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 the garden, you know, and, and God's walking through the, the garden, and He says, "Adam, where are you?" Mm -hmm. He knows where He knows where Adam is, mm -hmm. but He wants Adam to answer. Okay. And I think it's kind of the same thing. I I think in God's character, God is merciful, and God would not. I mean, I think He would have relented from from killing the righteous without Abraham asking, but I think for one, he already knew Abraham was going to ask that. Mm -hmm. And two, I, I mean, I think that God wants us to extend that same mercy and grace. And I think that God wants, you know, kind of to give us the opportunity to do that. Okay. So what about the, why did God have to see? Gracie, what do you think? Um, the why did God have to see? I think that's kind of like, okay, say, say Mike has grown up and he's gotten into some really bad stuff. Okay. He's in the drugs and alcohol, and I know he's been in the drugs and alcohol, but I have to see just to... So you're saying God doesn't believe <laughs> No, I think, no, not to believe, but I have to... 
I have to just see it to get. Are you thinking on human terms on or on God's terms? So is the question, why did God have to see the yeah, he says how many righteous people? No, no, right here it says, uh, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great and their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me. And if not, I will know. Why did he have to see according to the outcry that has come against him? Maybe to give him a chance. Okay. Like a, just a double check type thing? Yeah, I don't know. That That's really hard because he already, obviously, God knew. Mm -hmm. He didn't have to see it when it, with his own eyes. Like, well, well, I'm not too sure about this. Let me go check it out. Like, he knew. That's what I was saying. And, like, Gracie, your answer kind of implied that that's what kind of, And I, I didn't mean to laugh at your answer. It's just I got this image of Elmer Fudd, like, huh. <laughs> So honestly, that part I don't have an answer for. I don't know why God would have to go see because he already mm -hmm. okay. He already knew unless he's just trying to relate to Abraham in Abraham's terms. Okay. Know? Nicole, what do you think? I don't know about the first half of the question, but the second half, I don't think he would have killed the righteous. Okay. Um, just based on on his character. Okay. So let me kind of throw a wrench into this, just to kind of make you guys think a little bit harder. Okay. Um, when uh, let's say that when New Orleans flooded, that that was that that was God Himself pouring out wrath. Okay. Now, do you believe that there were no righteous Christians who died in in the flooding of New Orleans? I, I mean, I'm sure that there were. But that kind of goes against what Nicole was saying about this. What do you think, Grace? That wasn't God's wrath, though. We're pretending it is. We're, we're just saying well, for the we're sake of it. We're pretending that it's God's wrath, and I'm pretending like no Christians died. Then. Right, exactly. Gracie, That's what I <laughs> you're missing the point I'm trying to make. I'm trying to make you guys think. Roll with me on this. Because sometimes you have to, what is it, break a few eggs to make an omelet. Ouch. So I'm just an egg in God's omelet. That's nice to know. I thought God loved me. <laughs> I'm kidding, you guys. I'm kidding. I really don't know. That's a tough one. Well, this question is very loaded. Because I think there's a few things here. First off, God does kind of give um, final chances with a lot of different things. Um, if you talk to Christians who have backslid, for instance, a lot of them will tell you, you know, there was just this one time when I really felt like you know, after I'd been sitting for a while, I really felt like God was telling me, you better stop, and I didn't listen that time, and I crossed the line. You know what I mean? But then I, I think that there's a little bit more to this than that. Um, it says very specifically, I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me, which kind of implies that they had been acting unrighteously to other people who had then cried out to the Lord on behalf of these people who were, who, you know, Lord, why are you allowing this to happen? Yeah. That's what it kind of seems like he's saying. In which case, God was giving them another chance to, to turn or repent for their actions before he brought about the destruction. So either of those ways are, either of those are, are possible or there could be something else going on that we, we don't quite understand or see in our perspective. And as far as the second one, and that's why I said this was a loaded question. There, there really was no answer or just kind of a possible answers <laughs> um would he have killed the righteous without abraham asking possibly quite possibly um it is written in human terms to explain that's obvious is the fact that god didn't directly write it he used a person to write it and some of the things are more directly in human elements and some things are more directly in god's elements like for instance uh, in what is it joshua where god says specifically or where, where the uh, joshua writes specifically that um the that the sun stopped moving across the sky but we know that the sun isn't moving it's the earth that's moving right. well from man's perspective the sun stopped moving across the sky see what i mean right. it's yeah. not wrong it's just from this perspective yes that kind of makes sense so there is kind of an element in a lot of the different stories like that where, where it's where it's written in human terms but also there's there's this god does give time but he does there's a final there's a final um chance there there is a, a time when, when god says no more see what I mean? and and i think that that's kind of important to note 
um, because that's kind of what is going to happen in the end. You know, God is giving patience. He is giving giving mercy. He is given the opportunity for everyone who believes to be saved through, through Jesus Christ. However, there will be some who don't, and there will be a final time when God says no more. See what I mean? Yeah. So, um, but then also, no, there was no one righteous in the whole place. That's kind of important too. Um, possibly Lot, it's kind of confusing as to Lot is actually righteous or if he's just righteous in comparison to the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. Because obviously he enjoyed the benefits of living by or in Sodom and Gomorrah. And you see him get closer and closer as time, time progresses into Sodom and Gomorrah. You see him having a hard time leaving Sodom and Gomorrah, right. even when the angels tell him that it's going to be destroyed. Right. You see all these different things happening, and you really don't see him do too much righteous, except that he was the only person who stood up for the angels. However, he did so by offering his, what was it, daughters? Yes. Yeah. So, mm, righteous is a little bit of a stretch. I mean, ugh, ugh. I mean, hospitable maybe, but righteous, I don't know. Uh, Peter suggests that he is righteous, but he might once again be talking about him being righteous in comparison rather than him being righteous. It seems like Abraham is a key key thought in God's process as to why he saved Lot. Because yeah. it says as he's leading Lot away that he remembered Abraham. Yeah. Why would he say that? I mean, so whatever it was, it seems like Abraham was, was a factor to God's mercy to Lot. Um, but also there's this, which is important. God responds to intercessory prayer. Yeah. Righteous people must stand in the gap for, for a wicked nation, for a wicked people, for a wicked city, for a wicked family. See what I mean? Um, righteous people are tasked with that. That's why God repeatedly says not to, not to, curse, not to return curse, uh, curses for curses. Why, why he says to, you know, to... Um, uh, bless those who persecute you, to love those who hate you. See what I mean? To go the extra step, all these different things. He says it in a hundred different ways, um, and it all comes back to that. Um, so God's justice and love cannot be separated. Um, if, for instance, there were people who Sodom and Gomorrah had acted immorally against that God was standing up for, his love for them demanded his justice against Sodom and Gomorrah, for instance. Um, if there were wasn't anybody else, and he just had to give them a final, a final um, chance to repent. Well, then that still holds true that he was being, he was being just. However, he was also being loving. Um, um, okay. And I already talked about the way patience um, anticipates judgment. If there's no judgment coming, there's nothing to be patient for. Genesis 22. Obviously, I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but. Abraham is getting ready to sacrifice Isaac. Well, let me back up. God tells him repeatedly that he's going to give him an inheritance, which basically means his own heir. Um, and then finally, after years and years of waiting, God does. Then God asks him to kill his son, who he, who he is going to supposedly uh, bring about the blessing to all nations through. So already we have a little bit of a contradiction in what God's saying. It doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. But then we have Abraham go, and he goes ahead and, and does it, um, but God stops him right before he kills Isaac um, and, and tells him tells him not to. Uh, why did God want Abraham to sacrifice Isaac? He didn't want him to sacrifice Okay, why? Because that would go against God's character. Um, okay, so why did you even ask him if he didn't want Because it? he wanted to see um, how obedient Abraham would be. Okay. Even to the point of sacrificing his own son, would Abraham do even the most unthinkable thing in order to obey God? Wouldn't God have already known that he would have been that obedient? Yeah. But he still asked because... Because he wanted to see it happen. He, he, because he... <laughs> You're, 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 you're almost there. I know there. what I want to say, <laughs> but it's like I can't put it into words. Okay. Because it had it had to come to fulfillment. It it had to actually be, yes be yes done. that is exactly what I'm looking for. If you guys remember, we talked about um, Adam Eve in the garden, and I said that no decision can be made in a vacuum. Remember, mm -hmm. if there is not the opportunity for a decision to be made, that decision can never actually be made. Therefore, God gave us the opportunity to sin against Him so that we could obey Him. Right. This is the exact same kind of thing. God gave Abraham the opportunity to obey Him, even to the point of killing his own son. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. And if you notice, it's, well, that's a discussion for another time, but it, it seems like um, Abraham knew at least part of God's character. 
He didn't know him maybe to the full degree that we have opportunity to know him, right. however, because he didn't have the Bible. But it seems like he did still know at least to a degree because it says very specifically, he tells his servants, wait here, We're, we are going to go sacrifice the Lord and then we will be back. It kind of implies that Abraham thought something. So anyways, um, <clears throat> also this sort of event foreshadows Christ. Um, in that God sent his son to die for people. Um, we know this because at, um, when they're going up, Isaac asks specifically, where is the lamb to butcher? And they find a ram, not a lamb, caught in, um, caught in some bushes, which then obviously Jesus is the, the, the perfect lamb who takes away the sins of the world. Um, so this event foreshadows Christ and seems how Abraham was the progenitor. Is that what you want to say? Um, predecessor, uh, forefather of Jesus coming. It makes sense for him, who the promise was made to, to be put to the same test that God himself would give himself to. Does yeah. that kind of make sense? Mm -hmm. I know I've said that in a retarded way, but hopefully you get the idea of what I'm saying. Um, <clears throat> Abraham trusted God's promise past reality. That's a sermon in and of itself, so I'm mm -hmm. going to move on. Uh, God tested Abraham's faith since he would raise him up to father Jesus. I already mentioned that. Um, and we see that faith results in work, works. Abraham had faith in God, therefore he obeyed um, God even to the point of killing his son. Um, and God used this to teach future generations righteousness. How could God have used this as an opportunity to, to teach what obedience is if it had never happened? See, but Abraham's testing resulted in our triumph. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. God bringing Abraham through this resulted in us having faith in something that's already happened. It's easier to have faith in something if it's already happened before. For instance, how many of you guys have ever switched on a light switch? All of you, right? Mm -hmm. You have faith that when you flip that, it's, the light's going to come on, right? Why? Because you've done it before, right? You've seen it before. So this is for our experience, I mean for our, I'm sorry, for our faith to build because we have seen it in action, and if we believe it, it is now our faith has benefited from it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, anyways. <laughs> Did you guys hear that? Sounds like a lot. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's what I was thinking. Clever girl. <laughs> Numbers 22-22. Um, this is a story about a... a, a um, fortune teller, if you want to call him that, um, whose name was Balaam. And, uh, well, I'll just read this verse before I go. But God's anger was kindled because he went, and the angel of the Lord took a stand in the way as his adversary. Now he was riding on the donkey, and his two servants were with him. So let me just kind of set this up. This king called Balak um, is very nervous because Israel is coming, and he's concerned that they're going to wipe him out. So he asked for this fortune teller to come, whose name is Balaam, to come and curse Israel. And so when Balak's men come to Balaam, he um, goes to bed that night, and, and God specifically tells him, do not, do not go with these people. So then they leave, and th but then Balak the king sends more people, even richer people, of better, well, more well-known. Let's say, for instance, he sent Joe Biden the first time, and he sent President Obama the second time, just to kind of give you the – he gave the, you know uh, – more distinguished people at the same time. Um, and um, so then uh, God tells him, okay, go ahead and go. But then in the morning when he leaves, um, it says that God was angry because he, he left. Um, and the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way as his adversary. So that brings up the question, why did God let him go and then get angry with him for going? And I don't want you guys to just repeat something you've heard pastors say. I want you guys to actually put serious thought and tell me what you think. Unfortunately, I can only think of this in my own human capacity, and giving someone that's not good enough. And then giving someone, you know, giving someone a choice, you know, fine. If if you want to go do that. Just okay, do so it. you think God spoke it out of like a moment of uh, no I don't irritation? Think oh. That. Oh, okay. I'm, that's why I'm saying I can only think of it in my own human capacity as how I would react. You know, like fine, you know, go. Go do it. And then a wife actually, sing that? Wives never do that. they surely. actually go do it, and you're like, what the heck? <laughs> but, you know, like, you, 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 
you want them and you, and you hope with all of your heart that they won't be, do the stupid thing, even though you've just given them the permission to do it. And then when they do it, you're like, I can't get them in trouble. <laughs> Oh, yes, you can. <laughs> what the heck? You really did it? You're so stupid. Uh, whoa. I know. Anger. Aisle too. Okay, right. <laughs> you know, I think it's kind of... I mean, I guess you could kind of look at it on the same, you know, the same terms. God let him go, but I think that there was, uh, you know, God wanted him to make the right choice it's kind of I think when we pray and we, we ask God for something repeatedly and repeatedly and then we pretty much decide in our own heart that that's just what we're going to do and so you know you said try not to mention something that pastors have said but I'm going to do that Oh. you know <laughs> that sometimes God will let us do things even that he does not approve of because we've already made it up in our own hearts that we're going to do that. You know what I mean? Fine, go. You know, okay, go do that. You know, it's almost like God is saying, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm letting you go, but you're not being released from the consequences of what happens. You know, mm -hmm. I'm not saying that there's going to be no consequences. So let me follow that up with a question. Um, God only said no one time before... What? God only said no one time before you just turned him over to it. Seems kind oh, of impatient. No. No, no I'm I'm I, I, I'm not saying that. <laughs> I, I'm I am i am just trying to get you to get you to think. I'm not trying to get you to I'm not trying to disagree with you, Serena. I did the same thing to them like last <laughs> week or the week before. I kept saying things just to antagonize them. <laughs> right? Tag me up on this. Well you're you're <laughs> saying that God didn't God only told them no once. Well, how many times should God have to tell us no? Just to be a booger. <laughs> uh, 70 times 7, since that's how many times we have to forgive people. Well, then yes. God will tell us no, I guess, 70 times 7. But, but he I, didn't, though, with Balaam. He didn't, because Balaam's heart was hard. And, and Balaam was... Serena, so, I'm but. kidding with you. I'm joking. <laughs> it's okay, bud. I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> Did you have anything you were gonna say? <laughs> like, no, I'm, I'm done. I'm not jumping on that. Uh, I'm done. <laughs> that locomotive that's going nowhere. Um, the first thing to notice with this is that Balaam's heart was not in a good place. Right. And anything that Balaam did or didn't do was not going to be the right thing because his heart was already set on the wrong thing. Yeah, that's why I said um, Balaam's heart was hard. I wasn't disagreeing with what you were saying, Serena. I was just caught, I'm trying to make you think. That's it. <laughs> um, first off, he was hungry for wealth. We see that in, in, in the narrative. A couple different things that, that was mentioned. Um, when, the more, when the more wealthy people come by, he says, oh, well, let me just see if there's anything else God has to say about this. And then uh, afterwards, um, it says, where is it? Um, even if uh, he was to give me all, all of his gold and wealth... Oh, right here. Though Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not go beyond the command of the Lord my God to do less or more. Well, uh, he was the first one to bring up um, giving him the house of wealth. and <laughs> See what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then you see throughout it, um, and then you see right in the next verse here at 22, it says, The angel of the Lord took his stand on the way as his adversary, yeah. which means that whatever... God, whatever um, Balaam was doing was setting himself as an adversary of God himself. Right. See I mean, so that's kind of a, a, a note of a note of warning. But then also, well, I'll get to that in a second. Um, and I think it's also, you know, what does the Bible say? Do, you know, Jesus said, "Do not put the Lord your God to the test." Mm -hmm. And I think Balaam, you know, put God to the test with his foolery. Foolery. So we see a couple of things. We see his hunger for wealth, but we also see his pride. He gets so ticked off at his donkey <laughs> because it's ma it makes him look like an idiot. Yeah. Okay? But then also we see a little bit of corruption here, don't we? Mm -hmm. He can be bought. Mm -hmm. You know government officials who can be bought? Mm -hmm. this, was a, this was a religious figure that could be bought. This is a televangelist of their days, okay? <laughs> like Just a little bit of a word of warning there. Also, he was a seer, someone who God specifically said, 
not to do so not to do that. So we know that his statement that the Lord my God isn't exactly accurate, is he? Right. Because he's living in a lifestyle that God does not condone. So there's that. Um, he was not faithful to God because he worshipped other gods and, and did the other fortune telling things as well. Mm -hmm. There's that. Um, he was spiritually blind. His donkey saw something that he couldn't even see. Right. He was a spiritual leader. He couldn't even see that he was opposing God, nor could he see that the angel was about to kill him and his donkey or him. Uh, you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. And the only thing that saved him was a donkey. A stupid animal saved an intelligent so-called man. Right. See what I mean? Like this, the contrast is unbelievable here. Um, and they also didn't trust or obey God. Um, there's a few things. First off, um, God told uh, Balaam no, but he wasn't satisfied with that answer. So that's the first kind of thing to notice. And then God says, okay, fine, go. And I fully believe that God was, in a way, okay with a Balaam going if he did he listen, to, listen to God's voice. However, the fact that he had to ask again shows that he wasn't willing to listen to God's voice, doesn't it? Yeah. But let's just assume that God was okay with him, with him, you know, re-going over the same thing multiple times here. Um, God had to specifically stop him and almost kill him on the way there just to tell him, make sure that you don't curse those people because they're blessed, after he already told them that, told them that, didn't he? Yeah. So he had to retell him something that he had already told him. Obviously, Balaam's heart and mind wasn't set on God's kingdom, was it? No. See what I mean? Because he wasn't listening. Yeah. Um, anyways. Um, so there's just a lot of different things. It's very possible that God just said, okay, fine, your heart is set into it, go. Or it's very, also very possible that God was just waiting for Balaam to get more interested so that he could use him to bless Israel. Either way is possible. Don't really know. And the text doesn't really tell. It just kind of leaves this ambiguous cloud hovering over the story. But what's important for you to understand about the story is that it was not God's, God's will for uh, Israel to be cursed. And um, that Balaam's heart was not set on God's ways, and we're gonna where that's gonna resurface later in the story. Um, it was best for ba Balaam not to go, and I think the first answer was what was, was, was what was best for everybody. If Balaam was not to go, everybody won except for Balak, who would have died. Um, Balaam wouldn't have died later on, and he dies in this. I'll, I'll talk about this in a minute, but he, and Balaam ends up dying because of what happens in the story. Uh, Balak ends up dying, and Israel. Um, is punished by God because of some things that they end up doing because of this whole affair. Nobody won. Right. If Balaam would have just not gone in the first place, everybody would have won. Balaam probably wouldn't have died in the first place because of the reason that he died, and Israel wouldn't have been wouldn't have been uh, forced into that temptation, and Balak would have been killed. But he was already opposed to God, so that really wasn't that, that big of a loss, anyways. Is that what I mean? Um, God allowed him to go because he was stubborn and used it, but used it to bless Israel. That, that's that's what a lot of people kind of seem to seem to believe in the story, um, but this is a fact either way. God saw Balaam's heart was set on wickedness. That's why he had to stop him on the way, um, because of that. Um, and then also after the story ends, you know Balaam blesses uh, Israel. I think it's like three or five times or something like that, right? And then he leaves. But then it will hop down towards the end of Numbers, and he dies. They, Israel kills him, and you think, why did they kill him for blessing him? But then we find out a neat little, uh, a neat little info gristle later on in Numbers that he was the reason why um, the, people, the people went out and tempted Israel. Mm -hmm. Basically, he told Balak, he said, this is how you, how you get um, Israel. They're God's people. You can't touch them. However, if you can get them to do something to, to mess up their covenant with God, problem solved. See, Balaam thought that God's covenant was conditional. He didn't realize that they would have been punished, but that God's covenant would have still remained. See, I mean, he, he, he didn't see that. So instead he says, do this, and their covenant with their God will be broken. And this is what he told them to do. Have your women go out and seduce the men. They're not supposed to be doing that. So as they're you know, having all kinds of sexual fun, God will go in and wipe them out. Problem solved. But then God did end up bringing judgment, but then God's priests brought an end to that ju judgment that God brought because uh, they, they killed one of the two of the uh, lead, lead people in it, and the, and the plague stopped. So that's what Balaam didn't foresee happening. And then God used those same people of Israel to kill Balaam, who gave that, that, that advice to Balak. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. So uh, that brings us to this. Balaam went back to the king and told him how to get rid of Israel. After, which was clearly not in God's will. Seems how God specifically said, "Do not do something that's going to curse." He didn't curse him with his mouth, but he cursed him with his actions, didn't he? Right, right. 
So that brings us to a few um, various covenantal issues uh, that are in um, in the Bible that I want to just kind of give clarity on. Not much uh, way in dialogue on these, but um, they're just interesting to know. The first is Genesis 15:17, 17. Um, and it says this, When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. Abraham, um, well... God told him basically, look, I'm going to be with you and I'm going to do something great here. And Abraham said, how do I know you're going to do this? There, there, you know, I have no no air, nothing's happening here. And so God said, okay, go out and look at the stars. And if you can number them, that's how, that's how many your, your descendants are going to be. And um, then he has them take these animals and cut them in half and set them, set them in this thing. And, and, and Abraham waits and nothing really happens. And he has to chase out the birds and everything, and nothing's really happening. And then eventually Abraham falls asleep, and he has very uh, very bad dreams. But in the process of all this, this happens. The sun goes down, um, and it was dark. Um, and uh, and it was dark. Behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. Mm -hmm. um, and so what happens is that God manifests Himself in the in the um, uh, fire pot, smoking fire pot, and the flaming torch passing through the, the the animal corpses. What does that mean? Well, this was actually a um, Ritual, and where you took the thing, the, the animals re re represented it, and you walked through it, and you basically, it basically said, "May it be unto me as it as it is unto these animals, if I do not follow through on my plan." Mm -hmm. However, God is the only one who pl passes through the animals, whereas normally both parties would pass through the dead animals. Right. May it happen to me. God is the only one who passes through the dead animals, which is significant because oh, I didn't write it down. Um, God was saying, I am going to do this by my power and by my character. And so Abraham's fail failures or successes didn't really matter that much. I mean, obviously you can um, reject God's salvation and you can lose your salvation in the sense of giving it away. But um, not by simply messing up. This is, comes by a hardness of heart. Once you have, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You're saved and the only way you lose that, you're saved when you believe in God, right? But then the only way you can lose that is by deliberately walking away, not right. by. I, I kind of talk God into this and I'm saying this in a retarded way. And since you guys already know what I'm talking about, rather than tripping over my words, I'm just going to move on. Um, so that's important because God is establishing by himself uh, his covenant to Abraham and to the descendants of Abraham. Um, Exodus 4.24, this is another one that people kind of get confused about. In fact, a lot of people don't even know that this is an Exodus. Um, Exodus 4, 24-26. Uh, God has called uh, Moses, and he's getting ready to go to Egypt to do what God's called him to do. And this is where the story picks up. At a lodging place on the way, the Lord met him and sought to put him to death. This is Moses, who he sought to put to death. Mm -hmm. Then Zipporah, who's his wife, took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and touched Moses' feet with it and said, Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me. So I let him alone. It was then that she said a bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. So people kind of read this and they're like, whoa, that kind of came out of nowhere. But it's actually a, a very important uh, detail because Moses was being disobedient. Yeah. God specifically gave the covenant to who? Abraham. Mm -hmm. And in that covenant was the circumcision. But Moses had failed to, uh, failed to obey God. And even after he lived 40 years in Egypt, even after he lived 40 years in the wilderness, he still hadn't obeyed God. And so then God calls him to be a leader, and he still is living in disobedience and not obeying God. So then finally, uh, uh, God goes. God, God is uh, here about to put him to death, and his wife is the only one smart enough to figure out, oh, hey, we're living in disobedience. And so she circumcises her son on the spot, you see what I mean, to, to, to now be in obedience under God, which is a very important lesson for a few things. Number one, there is no such thing as being above and beyond God's ways. Oh, I, I'm just two rights of a person. I don't have to know. Especially leaders. He holds us to a higher standard than he would. Does that make sense? Because if, if God calls you to lead other people, he expects you to live in obedience to him. See what I mean? And so Moses is going to lead all of Israel out of Egypt, and he can't even obey God, and he's expecting them to obey God? See what I mean? Um, obviously not a, not not that realistic of, of a mindset on, on Moses' part. Um, and also, you kind of see Moses' life preserved by multiple other people. Throughout Exodus, you see Moses' life continually put in danger that he can do nothing about. It starts when he's a baby, and his mother and his sister save him when he couldn't save himself. So then, uh, out here, um, 
he's saved by uh, by his wife, and then later on he's saved by someone else. You know, what I mean, it's just had this constant thing going on of Moses' life being preserved by other people. It was just kind of a theme in Exodus. Um, and in Exodus 7, 1, there's another little thing that people... Um, and the Lord said to me, See, I have made you like like God to Pharaoh. It says specifically like God to Pharaoh. And your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. So the people always kind of trip over this. What does that mean he made him like God and Aaron is his prophet? Uh, well, it's not really as complicated as it seems. Basically what he's saying is that he he's going to give... Moses is going to be speaking God's very words. He's going to talk to Moses on a very intimate level, right. on a very uh, personal level. And, he, and those things that Moses is unable to do, like, for instance, public speaking, Moses wasn't too hot on, um, Aaron would be used as his prophet. What does that mean? That means that as God reveals it to him, Moses would then go tell Aaron what to, what to say and what to proclaim as his speaker. Right. Does that kind of make sense? Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I know it sounded really confusing when you read it there, but then you realize it's really not that com confusing, I thought. And this is actually a theme that's in a lot of um, – oh, no! In a lot of the uh, – in a lot of the Bible um, is God, ma God making him like uh, – making that person like God in the other person's eyes. Um, so anyways – um, so to close up all of this, we're gonna we're gonna wrap up the discussion we were talking about for the last two weeks, and that's those different questions that we had. Um, Serena, you weren't here for that, but we basically asked um, uh, we asked a lot of different things. We asked about um, does a thing have meaning or is it given meaning by people? Um, we like for instance an upside down cross. Is it inherently evil or is it? You know what I mean? Or does it just if you see it as evil? Um, the peace signs, tattoos. All, we talked about all kinds of different things. We talked about cussing. We talked about all kinds of different things. And I didn't really – for those of you who were there, Nicole and Gracie, um, before that, if he cries out loud, it won't pick up my voice in the recording. Um, what was I saying? Oh, yeah, um, you guys who were here, um, I didn't really clarify the questions too much, did I? I just kind of asked them, racked your brain about them, and moved on. Yeah. There was a reason why I did that. And so now we're actually going to get to that. There's a five-step process that I always use to in any moral decision-making that I do. And I think it's based on Scripture itself, um, and I just wanted to share it with you because I think it has – it really – resolves what we were talking about in the last two weeks. The first is what does the Bible say? This is where you go to the Old Testament first. You go to the Old Testament first, and then you go to the New Testament to see what it has to say about what the Old Testament already said. Okay, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You go to the Bible, but you start with the Old Testament, and then you go to the New Testament. Okay. Second is what does my conscience say? Do I know in my heart that the thing that I'm doing is wrong? See what I mean? So then the third thing, uh, what does a weaker saint say? Not does what does another Christian say. What does a weaker Christian say? Then what was this thing originally made for? What was its, what was its original purpose? And what does experience say is the last. These are, these are my five questions of moral decision-making. I'm going to walk you through them to kind of see how they relate to the different things that we were talking about. Ben brought up Christmas trees. We're going to talk about that. I brought up tattoos. We're going to talk about that. Drinking, the Buddha idol. Uh, Grace was talking about that. Um, somebody brought up a dream catcher. Grace, I, 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 can't, re I can't record with it. Oh, that's, that's good, Grace. Maybe if you just stand. Um, and then Grace also brought up the idea of what about the sun? It was worshipped, you know, things like that. Um, and then lastly, uh, well, I'll get to that in just a second. So uh, the, the, uh, the first few things is we are not a cult. We base our beliefs on the Bible foremost, not on a person. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think that's the first um, first thing, which means, and as, as the Bible says of itself, that all scripture is given for the purpose of, make, of, of, of building people up in the faith, of teaching them the way to go. Yeah. You know, um, So that that's obviously needs to be the foundation there. But then uh, also, the, the what is my conscience? Now, now watch out for this one because um, 
Our consciences are seared before salvation, and they're healed over the process of time by the Holy Spirit. So the, basically, the more we seek after God, the more our conscience is going to be changed. I think also we can talk ourselves into doing that. Right, which is why I kind of give it a little bit of a disclaimer. Really what I'm saying here is what does your conscience originally say about it? Right. The first thing your conscience says. Right. Not what you make your conscience out to right, say. Right, eventually. Right. <laughs> and then the third one, what does a weaker saint say? Now, that might sound funny, but in 1 Corinthians, there are two people. There are some people who were... Uh, indulging in, in the lust of the flesh, and they were saying it's okay because I have I have knowledge. Basically, I can eat this idol and uh, this, this meat that's been sacrificed to idols because there are no other gods. Whereas there are other people who are saying um, they, they were they were um, refraining from things. I'm not going to eat that meat because it's been sacrificed to idols. Right. See what I mean? Both people thought that they were right, and both people thought that they were more righteous. The people who abstained from things thought they were more righteous because righteous because they weren't indulging. Whereas the people who were indulging thought that they were more righteous because they knew that they knew the truth behind the thing. Right, right. And the funny thing about all is about all about that is that Paul says to look out for the weaker saint. Mm. He didn't say you are right or you are wrong. Right. He said your attention needs to be on the weaker saint. Now that's funny because those who are indulging are going to say that the ones who are refraining are weaker, and the ones who are refraining are going to think the ones that are. In, see what I mean? We always think the other person is the weaker saint. So who's to say who's the weaker? Exactly. And Paul <laughs> circumnavigated the whole issue. He just said, if you think somebody else is weaker, don't do something to offend their faith. Right. Problem solved. <laughs> he didn't say who was right and who was wrong, yeah. uh, which is which is just an amazing thing. Um, so let's just assume that, 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 the, that the stronger in the faith, whichever one that that is, um, was right and the weaker person was wrong. They still had to look out for the one who was weaker, not the one who was right. right. So um, that takes us to – I'm going to bring up some of the things we talked about over the last two weeks, and I'm going to run it through these five questions. First thing Ben brought up uh, about the Christmas tree. Uh, how do you condone having a Christmas tree when uh, pagans had it or whatever? Okay. So let's start with question number one. What does the Bible say? Um, well, it really doesn't say much ab about that, but it does kind of imply things about not offending other people. However, I don't know of anybody who gets offended about a Christmas tree, so that really doesn't apply too much in this one. Mm -hmm. We're just going to move past it because the Bible is kind of ambiguous in this one. You can really make it say, say anything you want it on this one. Um, what does my conscience say? My conscience says it's perfectly fine. Uh, what does a weaker saint say? I have yet to meet a saint who has who's offended by a Christmas tree. Uh, for what was this thing made for? A Christmas tree. See, this is where people get a little bit confused. Christmas trees are not pagan. Decorating trees is a pagan. It's something that pagans did do. But the idea of a Christmas tree that comes into your house. That is a Christian idea from the Germans in like the 1600s or something like that. Mm -hmm. So I mean, so it, it, it was not created for that. It was actually um, created for. Oh my gosh. It was actually created for the purpose of um, – well, I don't really want to get into it, but it has to do with the Garden of Eden with the way that it's an evergreen and uh, – yeah, long story. Okay. Um, so there's – really, what is the thing made for? Well, it's a, nothing for nothing wrong or immoral. Right. Uh, in fact, it did have a Christian idea behind it. What does what does experience say? Experience says that I've done it and nothing, nothing bad's ever happened. I've never had somebody deal with demons because they had a Christmas tree in their house. I've never seen that or heard about that. That's right. just never happened. Um, so then the thing about tattoos. Now I, you didn't hear. They had a, there's a new discovery. I'm so excited about this. Oh my gosh, I'm still so excited about. It. They discovered an Egyptian woman who had tattoo tattoos like we have today mm -hmm. on her neck. Because remember, I, I've al I've always stuck to this that we have no evidence of actual tattoos existing. They were just body markings, and and that is true. However, they're evidently at least to some degree were tattoos on some women, some of the Egyptian women at least, and she was mummified at the, about the same time that Moses and Israel was leaving Egypt. Wow. <laughs> this brings up a whole new realm of what, of what he was talking about with that tattoos. Are, are tattoos inherently evil? And I, I, I didn't answer the question. I just brought up the question. Mm -hmm. and, then I, and then I mentioned, or was he still talking about the body markings? Right. We don't know. We don't know. But once again, everything around the tattoos is talking about pagan worship. So I have an idea that it's not a tattoo in itself itself is inherently evil. I think it still is the idea behind the thing. See what I mean? Right. It's just my own take on that. Um, as long as my, – my opinion is this. As long as you don't get a tattoo for the purpose of your insecurity. 
what I mean? It, when, when, when people, and the Bible does warn about this, when people do things because they're not comfortable with themselves or when they're trying to get people to notice them more, um, wearing makeup, wearing, wearing uh, your hair a certain way, wearing uh, jewelry, giving, getting tattoos, it doesn't matter what it is. When your focus is on trying to make people love you for something that's not really you, right. your jewelry doesn't make you person you make you a person see what i mean yeah. and what what the bible is talking about is being confident in the lord yeah. with who you are and who you were made to be does that make sense right. not to say oh i was made this way so i can be a jackass no i'm not talking about that i'm saying who you are you know what i mean what you look like what, what you act like see what i mean mm -hmm. the things not the sinful things that you do but the character that's deeper than the, than the learned be <clears throat> than the learned behavior does that make sense right the you that, that's, that's hidden in there Past the things that you do. Does that make sense? So, yeah. anyways. Um, <clears throat> so, let's walk the tattoos to here. What does the Bible say? In the Old Testament, there's one verse that talks about not getting tattoos, but like I said, it's surrounded by other things that have to do with the pagan cult. So, we could say, don't get tattoos that glorify anything besides God. Okay. So, I, and by anything besides God, I mean, um, like a Buddha, a, a sign of a Buddha on you. I'm not talking about, like, Serena has right there on her leg, but what are they called? The Care Bears. Care Bears. I'm not saying something like that. I, I don't think that that's a sinful thing. I'm saying um, anything that, that goes against God. You know what I mean? Like yeah. the Buddha idol and, like, that kind of stuff. Well, even if I decided I was going to worship Care Bears because they were worth my worship, you know, <laughs> obviously that would make it totally That's wrong. a weird thing to worship. Why did I <laughs> Just... get it? I honestly cannot tell you to this day <laughs> what my true purpose was behind it. It was stupid, you know. It was probably more for the, what Michael said, you know, to make myself something, oh. uh, to improve my own self worth oh, in okay. my own mind. You know, yeah. this will make me cool. This will make this person like me. You know, mm -hmm. it was more for that. Which, like you said, God doesn't want us getting things for those purposes right. either. We should be confident in God, and right, we should right. be okay with God's love is enough. Yeah. I don't have to change myself to make other people love. Right, me. right, right. So. And that's really what it comes down to. Um, what does my conscience say? My conscience personally says that tattoos are totally fine. Like, I couldn't care any less I about people getting tattoos. I plan on covering up my tattoos, and eventually when I'm getting, you know, at least one or two new tattoos, I don't feel any, I don't feel conflicted at all about no. it. I, I, no. I, it has not even come up in my mind, this is wrong, don't do it. You right. Know? So. Um, question number three, what does a weaker saint say now? This is the one that always gives me <laughs> pause, because there still are older people who have a problem with, which is why I always give this advice wait five or ten years and then they will die off and there will be no problem you won't offend your brother right see what I mean and if you can't wait five years for it like maybe you need to readjust your your motives anyway see what I mean yeah um personally I'm too broke to afford a tattoo me I'd love too. to get a tattoo I'd love to get a full sleeve but I can't afford it that's me too I, I can't, can't <laughs> it. um what was this thing made for well we have no Definite proof that, that, that tattoos were made for the sole purpose of worshipping Satan or something. We just know that there were some people in the in the cult who used tattoos. So all things considered, I think it's best not to judge too harshly on things that are a little bit ambiguous and that can be used to glorify God like this. Okay? Um what was uh, what does script, what does experience say? Experience says that I've known a lot of people who loved God with their whole hearts who have gotten tattoos and nothing bad happened. In fact, in many cases, it opened up more doors of witnessing. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, next one on the list is the Ouija board. What does the Bible say? The Bible definitely tells against it a thousand different times in, in fortune telling and that kind of stuff. Um, what does my conscience say? My conscience definitely tells me that it's wrong. Don't do it. What does a weaker saint say? I have yet to meet anybody who agrees with that. Right? Like <laughs> it's just a terrible thing. What do, what was the thing made for? For the for purpose of, of communicating with the dead. What does experience say? I have seen a lot of demonic activity come through things like Ouija boards. A lot of it. See what I mean? And so all those things say no. Every single one of those things say no. So I shouldn't buy own a Ouija board. Next thing on the list, drinking. What does the Bible say? The Bible says that you can drink, just not to get drunk. Right. So um, that goes to the question number two. What does my conscience say? Alcohol runs in my family. I'm not touching it. I'm not saying you can't touch it. I'm saying it runs in my family. I'm not touching it. I've seen too many people ruin their lives by, by alcohol. I've seen uh, too many people not be able to stop it, stop at one drink. I've seen too many people throw away their lives, um, get into trouble because they, there was a guy who I, I don't I didn't I I actually just remembered that I heard this story. 
he raped some girl that was passed out drunk or something. Oh, and then, the, 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 yeah, the yeah, yeah. swimmer. Yeah, you remember this? No. And yeah. it wasn't his fault because it was a moment of... of it was alcohol. And it, and, and, and the judge said it was a moment of... of um, momentary Momentary lapse of thinking or something. I was like, what? He did something wrong. Did you hear the girl's whole thing that she read to him in, in court, that she read to the swimmer? Did you hear? Uh-uh. Did you ever read what she said to him? Mm-hmm. You'll have to go look that up, what she yeah. said to him. And I'm just surprised. Yeah, that that's that, not righteousness. I'm that's not justice. I'm just surprised that that, 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 um, you, know, you know, that that punishment stood yeah. um, after you know, what she had got up in court and said to him. And well, what I said... It was heartbreaking. Yeah. You know. and, and what I found to be true in the world is that money wins. Ultimately, in the world, money wins. Do you know why Hillary Clinton is going to win the presidential no- uh, nomination? Yeah, money. Because she's richer. Yeah. She has more people in her pocket. Yeah. Donald Trump just has too uncontrolled of a mouth. He says whatever comes to his mind whenever he com- whenever comes to his mind, and it's, it's not going to get him out of this pickle. And and uh, why was he let off? Because he's someone that people know. He's, he, the the judge said because it would it would ruin his future as a swimmer. Mm-hmm. It already has. No newsflash. What about that girl though? Yeah, they don't like, care about her. Who cares they about him? He was the one who did the thing. Swimmer. What about her? But the thing is, is that he's already now been banned from the Olympics. Any, well, you any know any the US thing is though the Bible the Bible continually mentions about standing up for for for, for the weak. And you can't honestly tell me that that she wasn't the victim in that situation. It, should she have gotten drunk? No, she shouldn't have gotten drunk. That was stupid of her to get a blackout drunk. However, that doesn't justify her being raped. You're right. That doesn't like, give anybody the right to. Right? Like what? That uh, it's just a stupid. Anyways, I'm getting off topic. Um, so drinking. What does the Bible say? I already mentioned that. What does my conscience say? I already said that. What does a weaker saint say? Well, if you decide that it's okay for you to drink, just try to do it. In the privacy of your own home, and try to do it where um, weaker saints aren't going to see you. Yeah. Try, try to. Um, what was the thing made for? Well, alcohol really wasn't made for anything good. <laughs> it was made for the purpose of intoxication. Right. Uh, so I mean, I I don't see that I can justify alcohol for myself. Right. Um, what does experience say? I have known too many people who are now in AA and who have their whole life controlled by a substance that they said was not a drug. And continue to live in denial that they are not controlled by this thing. And, are. and kill themselves by, because of depression. And get in the same, same uh, violent and abusive uh, patterns every single week. The same thing every single day. I've just seen it too much. I'm not going to fool myself. Um, okay, what about the Buddha idol? Even if the Buddha idol, regardless of whether, let's say, uh, we, I give the example, what about, like, let's say in a thousand years, nobody remembers what the Buddha, Buddha idol is for, and uh, is it okay to have it in, in your house? I said no. Uh, most everybody else said it really doesn't matter. Um, this is how I arrived to know. What does the Bible say? It's an idol, so obviously, no. Uh, what does my conscience say? My conscience is personally not okay with anything that at one time glorified Satan. It doesn't matter if even if it's still in use or if it's not it's still in use. If it glorified God, Satan at any time, I'm not interested in it. Yeah. Um, what does a weaker saint say? Well, in the situation of, let's say, a thousand years and it's forgotten, you don't really have to worry about that. And if it's nowadays, you do have to worry about that because there will be people who, who um, would have a problem with that. Uh, what was the thing made for? It was made for the purpose, the sole purpose of glorifying Satan, mm. the sole reason for the Buddha idol. Um, so then the last thing, what does experience say? I've seen a lot of demonic activity from household items, things that, oh, Christians, oh, no, Satan can't have control over me. And then they let things like idols in their house, and all of a sudden there's demonic activity in their house. Right. So in a thousand years, when you let that in your house because you don't really know what it means, well, then you're going to still have to suffer the consequences of what that means. Sometimes, yeah. In my opinion, you know. Yeah. You should always research things. Yeah, before that you're you not believe, sure say, or do. Them, you yes. know, before you, you bring them in your house. So, I don't know. In, in a thousand years, personally, I, I, I believe that, you know, if, if, if we are still here in a thousand years, the world is still here, I believe that Buddhism will still be around. I do too, honestly. And I do. I believe that we won't ever have the excuse of, I don't know what that means. <laughs> honestly, I don't think. I had to kind of rack my brain just to kind of get them to 
to have to answer questions that they wouldn't have been faced with. I don't know, Nicole, was it fun? <laughs> Yeah, part of a lot of interesting discussion. Yeah, a lot of interesting discussion. Um, but what was the same? I was just saying, okay, this is experience saying. And so because of that, I'm not real comfortable with, th with things no matter what it is. Um, I'm just not real comfortable with that. Experience has, has shown me too much demonic activity. Um, so then what about uh, dream catchers? Pretty much the exact same thing that I just said for the Buddha idol, in my opinion, applies to the dream catcher for me. Um so, uh, what about when people worship the sun? Well, let's go down the list. What does the Bible say? As long as it says not to worship any other thing besides God, right? But it doesn't say, I mean, you can't really take away the sun from existing without killing yourself. Right. So there's that. Uh, what does my conscience say? It's the sun. It's part of nature, which God cre created. Like, what, what are you saying? Like, what, what's your point here? Um, what does a weaker saint say? I have never heard a problem, have a, somebody have a problem with the sun. With worshiping the um, what was this thing made for? The thing was made for um, God's uh, glory and for our enjoyment, and to help put things into to help into time. The earth right. That he created. I mean, so obviously there's that. What does experience say? Experience says that that people will always find something to worship, but that doesn't mean that, that just because someone has at one time worshipped it, it is inherently evil. Whereas the Buddha idol is inherently evil. The sun is not. See what right. I mean? Because it didn't have that that uh, in its creation. Um, and obviously that means that no matter what um, what it's being used for nowadays, uh, anything that has a demonic whoops, that has a demonic uh, background to it is not welcome with me. Um, peace signs. Okay, let's 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 go back to that because I didn't didn't bring that one up. Um, it's kind of up in the air as to whether or not that was created for evil. Remember, uh, you weren't here. We talked about the um, Saint Peter's cross, the upside down cross, and how it's used for in, in Catholicism. It's been used in Catholicism for a long time. However, the occult also uses this sometimes in more modern times uh, to to kind of mock Christ. But the peace sign is in essence the Saint Saint Peter's cross in essence. So I mean, how can you say it's okay for Catholics to do it, but it's wrong because it's not a peace sign? So, I mean, and none of that, but a lot of people nowadays don't understand where it came from and don't know that it was used in the cult. So, and some people just think that it only dates back to World War II. So with all those things considered, do I see the peace sign as something that's of importance? No, not at all. It is not. It does not even factor into my moral decision making. Um, if something has the peace sign on it, fine. If it doesn't, fine. It's just like the tattoos, whatever. See what I mean? Yeah. It, it's not one of the things that enters into my equation. Um, as far as the upside down cross, I, ta I, ta I actually did mention this one last week. It wasn't created for the per for that for a wrong purpose. It was created in, in remembrance of Peter, who said, "Do not hang me in the same way that you hung Jesus. Hung me upside down because I'm not worthy." Right. So that's not really a bad thing, is it? No. See, I mean, so upside down cross is not inherently evil. See what I mean? So that this is my five five question process of, of any moral decision making that I make, which is why I do not have tattoos, which is why I do not drink, which is why I do not smoke. I mean, let's go down the list. Any questions on any of this? I think that whole upside down cross thing too has been made even more bad by um, Hollywood. Yeah. You know, I think it's been used more in like scary movies. You know, like oh, the it's ultimate contest, yeah. the ultimate thing that makes something you know evil. Oh my gosh, that thing has an upside down cross burned into it or whatever. You know? Right. Like, <gasps> so I think um, I think a lot of the things like that are just from one idea that somebody took. Blew it up and then used it a bunch. Yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah. So. And like I said, the cult didn't use it in their symbolism until years later. We're talking about just a couple hundred years ago that they started using it. See what I mean? So. Yeah. Yeah. But people more know it as. What yeah. They right. Exactly. Which, which if that makes the upside down cross wrong, then that makes this peace sign not wrong because once again, pop culture has made it into a sign of not attacking people, not into the thing of mocking Christ. See what I mean? Right. So if you're gonna hold the upside down cross to that sign and that, that standard, you have to hold the peace sign to that standard too. Because a lot of times I hear people do that. The upside down is, is it crosses is evil and the peace sign is evil. Well, you gotta pick and choose with that one. <laughs> All I know is I would have never known that an upside down cross was evil. If it wasn't for which movie? Which movie? We have to know. Which oh, one? Geez. I couldn't even tell you, Michael. Like I've seen so <laughs> many scary movies and that's been a factor in so many of them as to something evil is about to happen. That cross just went upside down, you know. <laughs> right. So that's just the thing. But and and so I, 
you know, I never, uh, I never knew anything about it or why it was evil or anything like that except for that. You know what I was thinking about the other day? I was, I was genuinely thinking about this. Um, I think one of the reasons why people are so ready to assume that it has something to do with the satanic is because sat satanic symbolism, we talked about this before, usually flips things backwards or it looks at them upside down, like, you know, the movie Nine, it's six flipped over upside down, mm -hmm. and, you know, stuff like that. And, or, or something where you read it backwards and, or, or hear it backwards and it'll be, oh, so, you see what I mean? It um, the satanic have used that before, and so I think people just assume cross, backwards, upside down. Upside down. It's evil, you know what I mean? Yeah. I think these kind of film. I don't know. I'm just shooting it, Shoot. shooting in the air, I guess. Whatever. Yeah. Any questions about anything we talked about? No. Okay. No. Next okay. week we'll be doing putt putt golf. Remember to let us know by uh, Tuesday afternoon if you wanted to ride with us. Okay. But and you're meeting at Kalichi's at seven, right? Yes. Okay.